MegCram.com. Hi, welcome to another COVID-19 update here on MegCram. Today, we're going to talk about the effects of different risk factors, both that could lead to COVID-19 infection, and that could be the result. So this was a study that looked at associations, and I thought it was really interesting because it nicely sums up what we've been talking about on MedCram for the last four years now. Yeah, believe it or not, it's actually been four years. And this study was published in Diseases in 2023, just last month in December, titled The Association of COVID-19 Infection with Sociodemographic, Anthropometric, and Lifestyle Factors, a cross-sectional study in an older patient's population aged over 65 years old. So this was a survey study, but I think it was actually pretty interesting because it goes over a lot of things that would not be surprising, but it's interesting to see because we talked about them during the pandemic. So this was in Greece, and they found about 8,121 community-dwelling older adults over the age of 65, and because they either refused to take part in the study, or they had severe disease, or did not complete the questionnaire, or there was missing data from their medical records, that got whittled down to about 5,100. And they basically asked them a bunch of questions, and then asked them whether or not they had ever had COVID-19 infections. So again, this is association, and as always, association does not mean causation, but it actually could be hypothesis driving. Based on other data, we tend to think that some of these things actually might cause an increased risk of COVID. So what they did was they took the raw data and they sorted it by whether or not they had had a COVID-19 infection or had not had a COVID-19 infection. As it turns out, there was actually more people that had not had a COVID-19 infection than those that did. If we use the cutoff of a p-value of 0.05, you can see that a number of these things become significant here when we're just looking at the raw data. For instance, age is going to sort towards yes on COVID-19 infection. Being male is going to sort to yes on COVID-19 infection. You can see a number of these in terms of residence, living status, educational level, smoking habits, BMI. But the key here is to understand that we need to look at the multi-regression analysis. This is the multivariate analysis assessing whether COVID-19 infection may independently be affected by sociodemographics, anthropometrics, and lifestyle factors in this population. So you can see here that age in a multivariate analysis was not statistically significant, but what was, was the type of residence. So rural versus urban with urban having the higher risk, about 38% increased higher risk. Smoking habits significantly increase the risk by about 72%, so a yes would increase the risk. BMI status increased the risk, and the waist-to-hip ratio was also very statistically associated with COVID-19 infection. We could also see that with depression, as well as the health-related quality of life score. Interestingly, sleep quality was also associated with COVID-19 infection with worsening sleep quality, increasing the risk of COVID-19 by 68%. We also saw that with anxiety, stress, and lack of exercise here with the IPAQ score. Interestingly, though, is the Mediterranean diet adherence. The Mediterranean diet is rich in whole foods, plant-based whole foods, and you can see here that there was a very statistically significant association with a low Mediterranean diet score and COVID-19. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we talked about sleep. This is in February of 2020. And we talked about the fact that poor quality of sleep and getting less than seven hours of sleep per night would impact our immune system, both in the adaptive arm of our immune system and also in the innate arm of our immune system. Not only can sleep affect your chances of getting COVID, but COVID can also affect your sleep. And someone who's been infected with COVID will know that very well. We've also talked about the Mediterranean diet. Specifically, we talked about sialic acids and a substance known as NU5GC, which is a sialic acid that is found in red meat, in non-humans, so that when humans eat red meat, this NU5GC sialic acid is absorbed into the body and actually incorporated into our own cells, which causes a sialic acid inflammatory reaction with an increase in antibodies. 
And there's been some recent studies that have associated plant-based diets with a reduction. A recent study showed a 40% reduction in COVID-19 illness. So it's interesting to me to see over the last four years all of the different issues that we've pointed out and their pathophysiological mechanisms in detail. And we're seeing here at first blush when we're looking at these patients that have now gotten COVID-19 in a population that the very things that we've been talking about that are risk factors for COVID-19 are showing up here in this associative survey. Let's talk about some of the things that we can do if we come down with COVID-19. We haven't actually addressed this in a long time. What are some of the things that you can do based on the information that we know today, and this is recorded in 2024, that I believe are pretty helpful and things that I would do myself? So we'll go through a quick run here. Number one is, and this is in no particular order, but you need to look at Paxlovid. It's a oral medication that you can take early on, and it's been shown to reduce the incidence of hospitalization. It's also something that can be taken pretty easily as a tablet, but some of the downsides are is that it can interact with other medications that you may be on. It can also cause a metallic taste in your mouth, and there can also be a chance of rebound after you stop taking it in terms of your symptoms. Definitely want to talk to your doctor about Paxlovid. I would consider this especially if you're older, if you have comorbidities and you're concerned about having to be hospitalized. So that's Paxlovid. Number two, sunlight. Sunlight's big, and we've talked about this a lot. Sunlight has near-infrared radiation. Unfortunately, most people are getting the flu and COVID now in the wintertime when the sun is the lowest. But sun still comes through at that level, and you should get outside because you're not going to get near-infrared radiation inside your home because of windows that block it. There's a number of theories why this might work. One of the theories is, is that it improves oxidative stress in the mitochondria in your cells and that this near-infrared light can penetrate deep into your body. There are a number of studies that have shown that sunlight improves outcomes and mortality in COVID-19. We've gone over these in the past. If you are watching this video and you would like some more information, please look at some of our videos like Light as Medicine. And a recent case that we had in the hospital where we actually treated a patient by taking him outside into the sun where he got a lot better. Now, of course, that's not evidence that it works. The evidence has already been shown And there's even a study in Brazil where a near-infrared jacket that they constructed in a randomized placebo-controlled trial showed statistical significant improvement and clinical significant improvement in patients with moderate COVID-19. So definitely, definitely, definitely sunlight 20 to 30 minutes a day out into the sun is something that I would definitely recommend doing. It's something that I recommend to friends and family when they get sick. Number three is hydrotherapy. We've talked about this. This is what they did 100 years ago during the flu pandemic. It had one-sixth the mortality rate. The current science on this is that they believe hyperthermia of the body that is controlled in a 20 to 30 minute period, either heating up in a sauna or in a spa or using fomentations to heat up the body. And we've talked about this before, so look at our video on hydrotherapy, that this increases interferon. Recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine showed single injection of interferon subcutaneously reduced the hospitalization rates for COVID-19 by 50%. This is something that you can do very early on. It's cheap. You don't have to worry about it getting hoarded. You don't have to worry about a supply chain, a prescription. It can be done very early on as soon as you feel sick. So highly recommend hydrotherapy and sunlight, by the way, also doesn't need a supply chain either. I can't speak enough about sunlight and hydrotherapy and the effects of these two things, and I'll tell you why specifically as well. No supply chain needed, no prescription needed. In most cases, it's very, very safe. It's not going to interact with medications, and it's not dependent on variants. This is also very useful, by the way, not just for COVID-19, but also for the flu, which we're not talking about at this point. We'll talk about that in a different video, but yes, very helpful. Something else that I recommend taking is NAC, and we've talked about this before as well, and the specific dose that I recommend is 600 milligrams orally, two times per day. And why do I recommend that? It's because it worked for the flu in a paper in 1997 when taken during a winter period of about six months. It reduced the symptomatology of the flu. 
There's also a lot of evidence that we've talked about that NAC, because of its ability to cut sulfide bonds, which is the mechanism used in polymerization of von Willebrand's factor and blood clots in the pulmonary vascular circulation, could have a benefit. And actually, there has been some studies that have shown that NAC is associated with improved outcomes in COVID-19. And so I think the risk is pretty low. There is some concern that taking NAC chronically at high levels for a long period of time could increase cancer risk because it feeds cancer cells, they believe, although these studies were done in animals and in very, very high doses. I'm recommending this only for a winter season. I think this is beneficial to do. Number five, zinc. Zinc has actually been tested and have been shown with colds to actually be beneficial. So I am definitely for zinc. There's pretty low evidence that this is harmful. I would not take too much zinc because it can reduce your copper levels if you take too much of it. And so just be aware of that. I would avoid going more than 40 milligrams daily of elemental zinc, because if you go much more than that, you can get a copper deficiency. What about vitamin D, right? Again, I said this was in no particular order, but a lot of you there are like, ah, he's not talked about vitamin D. I take about 5,000 international units daily, and I've had that tested to make sure that that is working for me. Some people also recommend taking vitamin K2. This is not vitamin K, which is a vitamin that helps your blood coagulate. Before taking K2, before taking vitamin D, I would definitely check with your physician and make sure you get tested because there are certain diseases that can already give you high vitamin D levels, for instance, sarcoid. So you want to make sure that it's okay to supplement with vitamin D and to make sure that you get your levels checked. Now, we did talk about zinc, and a lot of you out there will be asking, well, what about hydroxychloroquine and what about ivermectin? So let's put those on the list. And IVM. I was a big proponent of using hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin very early on in the pandemic when we had no studies, when there was a very clear pathophysiological mechanism for how it might work by being a zinc ionophore and allowing zinc into the cells and shutting down RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which was the virus enzyme. And there was some retrospective data that seemed to support that, and I was very excited about that because of our update 34, which is still available on YouTube, and you can watch that video in detail about how that works. However, at the time, I did say that to know that it is working, we would need to have large, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. And since then, we have had a number of them, and there's been some mixed results I'm not clear that hydroxychloroquine works. There may be a lot of associated improvements, and those could be due to confounders. The only way to really find out whether or not it works and actually causes people to be better is it has to be shown in a randomized, placebo-controlled trial setting that is reproducible that it works. Same thing for ivermectin. The interesting thing about ivermectin that I would say is that it is a very efficacious antiparasitic and there seems to be a lot of data that it may work outside of the United States. I would just make a mention that there are a number of people who have chronic parasitic infections that are not aware of this. And when they come down with COVID-19 and go to the hospital, they are going to get the cornerstone of inpatient therapy if they are on oxygen, and that is steroids. So steroids suppress the immune system for good reason, because that is what you want to do in ARDS so that they don't progress down the cytochrome storm pathway. Unfortunately, the collateral damage is that it also removes the immune system that is suppressing the parasitic infection. And so it very well may be that in people who have chronic parasitic infections, the addition of ivermectin may be very beneficial. Now, here in the United States, we don't see as much chronic parasitic infections. And so it may be the reason why we're seeing a difference. Other people have said that it may be the dose, it may be the timing, it may be other medications that need to be used with it. I'm here to look at the medications. This is my opinion. This is what I would be recommending at this point. In terms of hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, I do not believe that we have enough evidence at this point to say definitively with a randomized controlled trial that it works. I might also say, in addition to that, though, that during the pandemic when hydroxychloroquine was given emergency use authorization briefly, it was nearly impossible to actually get that medication because the supply chain was not mature enough to handle that kind of a demand. And again, this is the reason why I kind of like these areas up here. 
because these things can be used without fear of a supply chain shortage. And that's exactly the issue that we had during the pandemic was that we did not have truck drivers. We did not have infrastructure. We did not have the ability or pharmacists to dispense. And so the problem with pharmacological basis of a lot of these things is that they have to be delivered to your local pharmacy for you to have the benefit of it. And in another pandemic, that's not gonna be available. What I really like about number two and number three here is that those things are not limited in those situations. So understanding sunlight, hydrotherapy, I think, are really key, and that's why I've been a proponent of those two interventions. Since we're talking about zinc ionophores, quercetin is also something that I recommend and take. I think it's got very low risk factors, and if it works that degree, I would definitely recommend quercetin. Let me expand a little bit more about those two areas. So for sunlight, remember that near-infrared radiation can penetrate through clothes. And so while I like to get patients in direct sunlight, they don't need to be directly in sunlight. If you go outside, you can actually get a lot of near-infrared radiation off of the reflection from trees. That's actually really beneficial. In terms of hydrotherapy, you want to make sure that people can tolerate elevated temperatures because their heart rate will go up. So if they suffer from cardiac arrhythmias or issues like that, you need to be careful. And I would recommend highly that if you are going to do hydrotherapy on patients where you're actually getting them to sweat and increase their heart rate, that it's done with somebody there that can render aid if something happens. So for sunlight, I'd say 20 to 30 minutes. Same for hydrotherapy, 20 to 30 minutes. Now, what they do on the hydrotherapy is they end it with about one minute of cold therapy. And usually this is in a foot bath, which skin on the bottom of your feet exchanges heat very rapidly. That's why they use a foot bath. The hands would work as well. This tends to vasoconstrict and lock in that heat to keep the heat elevated longer to get that response. So if you're watching this for the first time and you're like, where is he getting all this information from? Look at the videos in our collection, specifically hydrotherapy, specifically sunlight. This goes over the scientific information and the data and the trials that we talk about. Also wanted to remind you to come to our website, mecram.com, which has a number of courses and continuing medical education classes and courses that you can take not only for physicians, but also PAs and Ps, RNs, and students as well. Things like EKG interpretation, pulmonary review, vasopressors, ultrasound principles and instrumentation, antibiotics review and hematology review, even classes on how to interpret complete metabolic panels and also CBCs. Come check us out at medcram.com.